Welcome back. It's Holy Week. I just made a video about Palm Sunday and that whole entry into Jerusalem on the donkey and how it was actually a political demonstration lampooning the Roman Empire. Go watch that video if you're interested in that. But let's continue this story because Jesus does a series of demonstrations that lead to his arrest and execution. The Gospel of Mark describes this next demonstration saying, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. This is a classic well-known Jesus scene. Jesus going to the temple, flipping tables. And I wrote this book, by the way, called The God Who Riots, Taking Back the Radical Jesus, came out on Broadleaf Books last year. The title is in reference to this demonstration. With property destruction, Jesus flipping over the tables and them likely breaking and looting, Jesus pouring out coins, and especially in the Gospel of John, it says this, and he, with a whip, drives out the animals that were being bought and sold. Like... This is very radical and because we're so distant from it, it's kind of hard to see that. But within their context, it totally makes sense why they wanted to arrest him. Growing up, the only time I heard about this story was in a sermon that was usually about like anger and talking about how, look, Jesus got angry one time in this story when he entered the temple and saw some stuff he didn't like and then just started flipping stuff. But I really don't think this was a spontaneous temper tantrum. If we look at it more closely, we can see that this was a planned demonstration. And he's not just flipping whatever's in front of him. He's flipping the tables and seats of those who are buying and selling and not allowing people to bring in or bring out anything. And here's what's also important that a lot of people miss. The buying and selling of sacrificial animals to those who couldn't bring an animal was normal. It's laid out in the Torah that part of worship in the temple is being able to buy an animal there if you weren't able to bring one. Jesus was not against people buying and selling in the temple. So this idea that Jesus enters the temple and sees buying and selling is like, what is this? It wasn't supposed to be like this. That doesn't make sense because it's always how it went down. The reason Jesus flips those tables and seats and doesn't allow people to carry anything through or out is because he's intentionally putting a temporary hold on the activities of the temple, particularly the outside courts of the temple. Because here's another really, really important thing. He is not protesting against the temple itself or against sacrificial worship itself. And most importantly, Jesus is not protesting against Judaism. Jesus was never against Judaism. And so many people have read the Gospels with an anti-Semitic lens and have placed anti-Semitism onto Jesus in this scene and have read this story as if, oh, here comes Jesus, who's trying to start a brand new religion, Christianity, which he wasn't. And then he sees Jews doing what Jews do in the temple. It's like, nah, I ain't about this. And it's like, no, 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 no. If Jesus wanted to protest against the sacrificial system or Judaism itself, he would have started flipping, flipping things like deeper in. He could have waited until he was making his sacrifice to start doing that. Instead, he does it in the outer courts where Jews and Gentiles would be so he could put a temporary hold on everything so everyone would listen. And he uses this opportunity to say, you've turned this place into a den of robbers. And here's where it can also get confusing because of the way that this story is told so many times. People think, oh yeah, the people selling things are the robbers. And that's why he says, you've turned this place to a den of robbers. But that's not what den of robbers means. A den of robbers isn't where people get robbed. A den of robbers is where robbers go and hide to avoid the consequences of whatever they did. So Jesus is accusing the religious leaders of his day of using the temple to hide and avoid the injustice going on all over the place. And once again, like I said in the last video, Jesus is aligning himself with the Hebrew prophets intentionally. And the prophets talked about this all the time too. Like I think of Amos talking about how they've prioritized worship over justice. And another clue that reveals Jesus's intention here is the story right before this one, 
where on the way he sees a fig tree and he goes to check if there are any figs on it and he sees it's just leaves because it's not the season for figs and then he curses it and says may no one ever eat fruit from you again and then on the way back from the temple demonstration they see the fig tree again and notice that it's dead and that's all the details we get on this fig tree it's a very strange story but it seems to symbolize Jesus's message and intention when he's doing this temple demonstration. The very place where he expects there to be fruit, there is none. And fruit as in good works, the work of God, the work of liberation, the work of justice, the type of work that the Hebrew prophets talk about God desiring, taking care of the widows and the orphans and the foreigners. That's like God's litmus test for judging a nation. Also, Jesus's den of robbers line is directly quoting an earlier Hebrew prophet, Jeremiah, who also had his own temple demonstration 600 years earlier. In Jeremiah's temple demonstration, he's giving this prophetic word, speaking on behalf of God, and he says, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then, come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are safe, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know I too am watching, says the Lord. So the den of robbers line, being more so a place where robbers go and hide is way more clear in the Jeremiah story, which is what Jesus is directly quoting. But something else I find really interesting about Jeremiah's temple demonstration is that it begins with him speaking at the gate of the temple. And he says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And it seems like this repetitive phrase, this is the temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord, was something that had to have been said a lot in the temple and probably said when they felt like someone was disrespecting the temple. Like, hey, do you know where we are? This is the temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord. It's like as he's beginning to condemn the people there for turning the temple into a den of robbers and avoiding the injustice going on around them, he's totally prepared for people to say, hey, this isn't the time and place. This is the temple of the Lord. And Jeremiah says, don't trust these deceptive words. And I also imagine plenty of people during Jesus's temple demonstration probably also thought, hey, wrong time, wrong place, Jesus. Like, I get it. I get your message. I, I'm for the cause too. But can't you just protest like over there where it's less inconvenient? Same as today's protests. In December 2014, at the Mall of America in Minneapolis, there was a huge protest with more than 1,000 protesters, and they're protesting the police murder of Michael Brown and Eric Garner. And 25 people were arrested for trespassing. Then, a year later, December 2015, they planned another Black Lives Matter protest there. This time in response to the Minneapolis police murder of Jamar Clark. And the day before the protests on CNN, they interviewed the attorney for Mall of America to get her take on this. And she said, I totally get the message. I totally respect their free speech rights, but a demonstration doesn't belong on private property. She said, come here and shop. That's what we're about, not about demonstrations. And then they brought on one of the organizers of the protest, Miski Noor. And they said, why can't you just move your protest outside? People can see your protesting as they pull into the parking lot by the thousands. What's so wrong with that? Well, it also brings, um, Carol, it also brings to mind the um, idea that Martin Luther King Jr. even put out there that Dr. King said uh, about people who agree with your message, but not with your tactics. Um, we don't need anybody to agree with our tactics, right? We are, we're, we're disrupting business as usual. That is the whole idea. We're not going to stand in a corner and protest because nobody pays attention to that. We are going to disrupt your life. You are going to know that business as usual in America and the world world is not going to continue while black people, unarmed black people, are literally being shot and killed by law enforcement in the street every day. Um, and, and the mall is a, uh, I know people will get caught up in this idea about the mall not being the right venue, but the mall itself is, is this coliseum of capitalism. The mall practice, uh, the mall participates in this anti-black racism and white supremacy. The Mall of America has been investigated by the Minnesota Department um, of Human Rights for violations 
it's for the way they treat people of color in the mall. So these same issues that are that we're seeing in police departments are manifesting in the mall and people of color and black people are being affected ne uh, negatively because of the way the mall decides to act. So that is why they are an appropriate target. So it's an ancient tactic to try to shut down protests and say it's wrong place, wrong time. And yet it's precisely the places where people would say that that turns out to be the best place to confront what they're protesting. The Mall of America was that kind of place. The Minneapolis police station that was burned down during the George Floyd protests was that kind of place. And the temple was that kind of place. And we still see that all the time. All this, we support the message, but don't disrupt anything. Don't try too hard to change anything. But there must be a disruption. And there must be actual change, not just empty vocal support. And we're seeing that now with more protests against police violence and protests against gun violence and protests against anti-trans violence. All this violence needs to be confronted. We can't just avoid it. And when Jesus accuses the religious leaders of using the temple like a den of robbers to hide and say we're safe, it's so interesting because I feel like it's more relevant than ever because we all know Christians, people who claim to follow Jesus, who also use their religion to hide and avoid in that way. So to all the churches, I believe Jesus would also say, you've turned this place to a den of robbers. Like, what are you doing? You think you can come here and think you're safe while avoiding all the injustices going on in the world? Jesus and Jeremiah would tell us that. And we're seeing people wake up in general, but also within these churches. And one of the things I talk about in my work is my journey leaving evangelicalism and talking to a lot of other people who have left evangelicalism. And so I'm seeing these common patterns, like every couple of years, there's a major political event and people feel like this needs to be confronted. This needs to be talked about and we need to do something about it. And they just witness their entire church just completely avoiding it or just blatantly being on the wrong side, on the side of violence. And those are huge moments for a lot of people who suddenly realize, oh yeah, this is not the place for me. And then they leave. Some people leaving Christianity entirely or religion entirely. Some people leaving and looking for a healthier, more liberative version of their faith, which is what my work is about. But people are going to keep leaving as long as these churches are used as a den of robbers. So yeah, talk about way more details, of course, in this book, The God Who Riots. I think y'all would find it really interesting if you haven't checked it out. And we're going to keep making these videos throughout this holy week. So subscribe, share these videos with somebody. And if you want to support the channel, please check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash Damon Garcia. And I really appreciate everybody over there. And I appreciate y'all watching this. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>